applause for bad news, huh? So there are definitely issues affecting the markets, and I'm going to talk about those, and then Kirk's going to pretend that they don't exist. The first issue, obviously, is the war in Ukraine with humanitarian costs that cannot be measured. Uh, and certainly our hearts and our prayers go out to the people in Ukraine. There is also an economic cost to what is going on. I'm sure as you are aware, Russia is one of the leading providers of energy, the third largest producer of oil and the largest producer of natural gas into Western Europe. And the West collectively is trying as best as it can to prevent Russia from selling any of its product, including energy, oil, and natural gas. And when you lower supply and demand stays high, prices generally rise. And I'm sure you've seen that as you try to fill up your tank and you look at the price of gas and you gasp. And at least part of that is because of what's going on in Ukraine. Another inflationary aspect to this war is that Ukraine and Russia collectively are two of the largest grain producers. And it's the same story. People don't want to buy Western uh, uh, Russian grain and Ukraine can't get the grain out of its country, so we've got a shortage. Grain prices rising, food prices rising, and inflationary impact because of the war. One of the potential positives coming out of this is the increased realization of the value of collective defense. What this slide shows is NATO countries and their spending on defense as a percentage of GDP, gross domestic product. What you can see is the US leading the charge at 3.6% of our GDP. To put that in some kind of perspective, the Russians spend 4.3% of their GDP on defense. And you can see on the way down, below the 2% target of NATO, France, Turkey, Germany, Canada, Italy, a fair number of very large countries. However, the recently elected Chancellor of Germany, Scholz, said he indeed would increase his defense spending up to that 2% target. And if you assume that these countries do the same and you bring in Sweden and Finland who would like to join NATO and they spend to that level, you're looking at an incremental defense spend of $36 billion. So getting there, horrendous humanitarian cost, but perhaps as the value of defense rises in the eyes of countries, we will not have another Ukraine going forward. Other issues affecting the globe, supply chain constraints. And I'm sure here too you are aware of this. What this slide shows is the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, and they import or realize 40% of all the imports coming into the United States. So a critical choke point in the supply chain world. And what you can see is container ships queued in, in the ocean of the Pacific, unable to unload their cargo because cargo is sitting on ports, unable to move inland. So a logistical problem, if not nightmare, in the United States. Exacerbating that situation is China's zero COVID policy, where the Chinese have elected in order to battle the pandemic to shut down cities when they have cases of COVID. So they've shut down Shenzhen, they've shut down Shanghai, they've shut down Beijing. And when they shut down those cities, people can't go to the factories. And when they can't go to the factories, factories don't produce anything. And when they don't produce anything, you've got supply chain shortages. I'm sure you've heard of chip shortages. At least part of that is because of China's COVID policy. And again, shortages lead to inflation. What do we see when we look at the US economy? How many of you remember the pandemic-driven recession of 2020? At least a few of you. So we were able to get some video of policymakers as they considered an, an alternative, a response to the recession. Let's watch. Sir Arthur, a giant sloth has attacked our service up at Slough, bringing great unrest to the customer base. Consultant Ned, what do you advise? You must build a giant catapult to fire the greatest of projectiles at the sloth. What kind of projectile? 
Are you suggesting we throw money at the problem? Precisely. So, while we didn't build a giant catapult, which I think would have been really cool, uh, the US government indeed threw money at the problem. And the easy question is, did it work? And the short answer is, yes, it did. What this slide shows is the unemployment rate in the United States. And what you can see is pre-pandemic, we were at 3.5% unemployment, a very, very strong jobs picture. Then the pandemic came and the recession came and the economy went out and the unemployment rate spiked to over 14%. The government, as you saw, threw money at the problem and as quickly as the unemployment rate rose, it fell to today's 3.6%, an enviable level, certainly. Federal Reserve Chairman Powell, though, says he doesn't like the unemployment rate at 3.6%. And the Fed's charge is employment and price. So why would he be unhappy with a 3.6% unemployment level? And the answer is because of topic number two, price. So what do we see when we look there? This is a chart of the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. Along with the stimulus, and at least in part because of the supply chain issues and the war in Ukraine, we had economic recovery, but we also had inflation. And today's inflation number was 8.6%. So for the first time in 40 years, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin and brought kerosene to light the lamps, we got inflation. The Fed would like our inflation rate to be 2%. So 8.6, 2, <coughs> carry the one, that's a lot. So we got a real inflation problem. So I mentioned stimulus, and the question is how much stimulus was applied to the economy, at least in part, to drive this level of inflation. One million dollars! <laughs> well, Dr. Evil, he kind of missed it. What this shows is the Fed's balance sheet. And pre-pandemic, the Fed was running a fairly robust $4 trillion in their balance sheet. And you can see that that jumped significantly to over $9 trillion in just a few, a few short months. What was the Fed doing with all this? How is it stimulating? Well, what the Fed was doing was taking money from the Treasury and going into the open market and buying bonds, pushing money into the economy, pulling bonds out of the economy, and driving interest rates down. Tremendously stimulative. And as we saw, it worked. That process was called QE, quantitative easing. With inflation, the Fed is saying, eh, we're not going to do that anymore. So the question becomes, the $64,000 question, the $1 million question if you're Dr. Evil, the $9 trillion question if you're the Fed is, what happens when you start to sell those bonds into the economy? So the exact opposite of quantitative easing, where you're pushing bonds into the economy to suck money out of it and to drive interest rates up. And that process is called quantitative tightening. And no one knows how much the Fed is going to sell. Is it a trillion? Is it four trillion? We, we will see. But why would the Fed do this? And the answer is the Fed would do this to slow the economy. And why would the Fed want to slow the economy? Because it wants to get inflation under control. So another question is, can it work? What this slide shows is inflationary expectations. So what the Fed does is look at what bond markets are saying and what people are saying, and their expectation for inflation five years out for the next five years, which is a little bit geeky. So think about 2027 for the next five years, what do you think the inflation rate is going to be? And what it is today, you can see it has certainly risen coming out of the pandemic, but today inflationary expectations for the long term are 2.3%. Again, the Fed's goal is two, we're at two, three, so the Fed's got a chance. 
having said that, as I mentioned, big headwinds, war in Ukraine, supply chain issues, and tremendous stimulus still sloshing around in the economy. So can the Fed pull off a soft landing? Uh, we will see, and for that question or answer, I'll turn it over to Kirk McDonald. <laughs>